The red light is on. <laughs> it is going. <laughs> we should do the rest of this with just an NPR voice. Welcome back to the Family Movie Night Podcast. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining there us. We're, we're here to talk about your family and how we can help you talk good conversation <laughs> with your family. <laughs> I am the heel of this podcast. Or, <laughs> or we spend the rest of the time just in Chris Tucker voice. <laughs> so, no, all all of of you didn't like my all of us except for Nathan are doing NPR and Nathan does Chris Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> only, only one person is like Chris Tucker. Okay. <laughs> movie night podcast where we want to help your family have better conversations around the content you consume and we have a really fun family movie especially if you've got young kids uh this one fits really in the kind of slapsticky goofy silly kind of comedy that may not work as well for your older teenagers but i think for that prime spot of like pre-teenage maybe even a little younger uh, my five-year-old up to my 10-year-old loves this movie. It's Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day uh, based on the classic children's book. But in case you don't know what it's about, Alexander's day begins with gum stuck in his hair followed by more calamities. However, he finds little sympathy from his family and begins to wonder if bad things only happen to him. His mom, dad, brother, and sister all find themselves then living through their own terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Uh, this movie's really funny and uh, pretty heartwarming. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first, Donnie, why don't you tell them what we do on this podcast? Yeah, so on this podcast, we encourage every family at Community Christian Church to have a monthly movie night to help you and your children build memories, start conversations that'll matter. The goal of our family ministry is the help you to raise your children to love Jesus and his way of life above all other things. And we know that critical to that is for you to have a routine, regular time of connection for some shared experiences that'll help you build stronger relationships. And, you know, movie nights are great opportunities to do that because, you know, movies are an easy way to share laughter and joy and, you know, and even fear and sadness in a safe environment. But, uh, but more than that, I think they give us a chance to talk about what matters uh, most to us in ways that are meaningful and memorable. Um, and, and on this podcast, we, we want to not only recommend some movies you could watch on your monthly movie night, but, you know, give you some ideas of meaningful conversations you can have with your ch children during or after the movie. And as always, the point of this podcast is not to give you one more thing that we, um, as parents can feel guilty about whether we do or not do, but we want to make it easier for you and your kids to have conversations and enjoy being together um, and just have fun. So uh, we want to help you think through easy and simple ways that you can share your love of Jesus in those conversations with your kids. So uh, today, I think it's a perfect opportunity to talk about that. If you've already read the description, you kind of know what themes we're going to talk about. And I think especially for younger children, but I'll say especially for a moody preteen teenager age, this movie is really a great opportunity to talk about how does Jesus help us through bad days and not through like really horrible grief stricken tragedy uh, days, but just normal everyday life ain't going my way kind of days. Uh, as as uh, we talked about a little bit uh, earlier when before we started filming. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about why this movie is a fun movie uh, for families to watch together. And so uh, let's just kind of highlight, you know, especially and, and really kind of thinking through younger kids. I will say all of us kind of said this movie's kind of silly and, and pretty goofy in a way that I think teenagers probably are going to be like, that's lame, that's stupid. So I will say if you've got older teenagers, this may not be a movie to watch because they will kind of ruin it for your younger kids. But I think if you've got young kids, you know, like I said, five to maybe 10, 11, 12, I think there's a lot that they're going to like in this movie. So, Sawyer, why don't you start uh, kind of talking about uh, what is it that you think young kids, you work with in our children's ministry, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, what is it you think kids are going to find funny about this movie? 
Um, for one thing, um, I think they'll find the character of Alexander really funny. Um, I think that and probably it, relatable. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where I was going to go. Like more so relatable is the thing. Um, just because I think that, you know, the writers of this movie understand kind of do a good job of understanding a, I don't, what is he in fourth or fifth grade? Um, yeah, it's something like that. I think he, he may have started middle school by this point. Okay. Cause he and his sister, I think go to the same school and she's like eighth grade or something, you know, she's in that school music. So, okay. Got yeah, 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 yeah. So is he in like, he must be in like sixth grade. Then. That's what I'm thinking. I don't think he's supposed to be a year younger than her, but no, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Um, no, I mean, I think they'll like him. Um, I think that, uh, the movie is also, yeah, I mean, it's really goofy and slapstick, slapsticky humor. And, um, you know, I think, uh, Oh, gosh, we're going to get into this a lot. I think Steve Carell is like the backbone of this movie in like Absolutely. every single way. Um, he is excellent in this movie, um, both like his acting chops in the not so funny moments and also his the the humor that he brings. I mean, it is it is clear that they were like, OK, we've got a good, funny script for kids. We need someone that can come in and do some legwork that will at least keep the adults entertained a little bit as right. well. And that's what Steve, like Steve Carell entertains everyone. Like teenagers might not like love this movie. I do actually think that some of the Steve Carell stuff in this movie, I think a teenager would even uncynically, like very just unironically really like. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to shout out how well I think Jennifer Garner does in this oh, movie. Yeah, she's so good. In what I think it could have been a pretty thankless role um, as the mom who's kind of the, uh, you know, she's a war, a warrior and all those kind of things, but she brings such heart to it and such realism. I think, uh, as parents, you, you, you really feel for her, you get a sense and lots of comedy. Like she's willing to be the butt yeah. of the joke a lot of the times. And I think that she just does an excellent job, but I agree. Steve Carell, absolutely wonderful. Heidi, speaking of, uh, the mom role in this, I know you mentioned uh, as parents, uh, there's a tug of war going on on the inside, which this movie is so syrupy, sugary, sweet, especially in the finale, uh, that you, you have the back and forth of having young kids and still wanting to dream as if this is reality, but also having a 19 year old and lamenting that it, <laughs> It may not perfectly reflect how reality works out. Yeah. So the uh, the most real part of this movie for me was mom seeing everybody's privates in this car. <laughs> yeah. yes, <that's laughs> like, a, yes. yes, that that's real. But uh, definitely the teenage son, I was feeling a little bit of resentment because, uh, you know, he, he wants to stay home from prom with his gorgeous girlfriend who's super popular uh, and spend time with his family, uh, namely his little brother's birthday party. Doesn't want to miss out on that. And um, yeah, I feel like I was like, this is not real life. This is not the way things go. Right. So, so yeah, so I was a little bit grumpy with this film, but um, mostly, uh, mostly just how the family, you know, is so together and all that, yes. but that's every, you know, but I think overall um, the movie is so good. And my favorite part about the way that it's done is that um, Steve Carell is, he says it, but most often he just shows that you don't have to get stuck in the bad things that happen. And for somebody who tends to get stuck and tends to get, you know, really uh like obsessive thinking about the things that have gone wrong so far this was a good way for me to see how to model that for my kids where okay right. yeah that didn't go or so far this day hasn't gone the way that we would like it to but, but that doesn't mean that the rest of it has to be bad too so that was good yeah and i think you know what you mentioned there uh heidi is this movie to me feels a lot like um this is us or parenthood those tv shows where it's really syrupy sweet and like no one's family actually functions this way but we all kind of hope it does and our hope it will and it's that version but for like families that have little kids like it's this like oh my family's gonna be just like that but like you said yeah. probably not realistic that your teenage yeah. son is gonna stay home from prom to just sit and hang out for a birth for his little brother's birthday party so Yes, uh, moms, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> yeah, the other thing that's absolutely... We're going to choose the girl over you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ooh, calm down, honey. <laughs> uh, We're ruining everything for, the, that's right. for moms in the future. 
uh, I will say the other completely unrealistic part of this movie is who's what school system schedules the eighth grade uh, spring play on the same day as the prom. Like <laughs> those things are happening on the same day. Uh, but anyway, all right. Donnie Dorsey. And what crazy parents schedule their kid's birthday party on the same day as all those other all things. All those things. And also the driver's test before prom. Like, yeah, we got time for it. <laughs> I will say this. At first, I was like, that's really unrealistic. And then I go, no, I know people's schedules. I know how people do stuff. They're just, everyone is trying to cram everything in at the yeah. last minute. I get that. All right. Donnie Dorsey, hero of our podcast. What What is it that you, that you enjoy about this movie? So I just love the heart of the movie. Like I, cause I think at the heart of it, it shows like that parents genuinely want the best for their kids. Um, even if it doesn't always work out as they expect it to. And as kids, like as much as sometimes they can frustrate and create like situations that make you upset with them, they do genuinely care but sometimes we don't see it in those moments. And I think yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like the, that's where the heart is because like, yeah, I don't think he's going to stay home for a prom. Like, you know, cause I mean, they're, they're not going to stay home with the, with the family for that. However, you know, there is that heart to it to saying that, yeah, sometimes your kids will choose to pick your pick family over the alternative, which is always a plus. Well, and I think, I, so I also I I really enjoy this movie. I remember the first time I saw this movie. So I'm thinking, what what was it? 2014 is when this movie came out. Yeah, I think so. And my wife and I had gone to see it in theaters. Or actually, I think I went and saw this without her. I think this was one of those days. But we used to have movie pass. If people remember the days of movie pass. And I would go on my day off from work, which was Monday, and she was still working at the time, and go see whatever movie she didn't want to. And so I would always just be, and normally it was like some little kids film she didn't care to see. And so it would be me and like stay at home moms with their, <laughs> with their kids watching. And I watched this movie and I was not really into it. Uh, but I watched it, I think twice with my kids cause they enjoy it so much. And I think there's something fun as a parent to watch these kind of movies and see their reaction, especially when it's not like a cartoon, when it's like a more realistic, like, real world problem stuff and like i can see that they're just understanding how the world works yeah and how helpful that is and i think as parents if you've got young kids like i said i think this movie is perfect for five six seven eight even up to maybe 12 13 i think the problems are relatable they can understand it's still goofy and outrageous enough that you're going to get laughs whether there's physical comedy for the little kids and some actually some pretty decent written jokes uh for the older kids who can kind of understand those things so I think it really works. And here's what I'll say about the themes as we're getting into it. This is a movie that I think is really kind of invaluable when you get young kids because we've done a few episodes like we did just recently, the Bumblebee episode about how do you deal with pretty big tragedies, you know, a death in the family or a divorce or those kind of things. But those are not every day of your life. Yeah. This is a movie about the everyday struggles of some days are just bad days. Uh, you know, sometimes... Your clothes never wear as well the next day. And your hair never falls in quite the same way as the great poets Nine Days wrote in Absolutely Story of a Girl. Uh, and as we also mentioned, and some days you're just going to get knocked down and you got to get up again. And they can never knock you down, like Chumbawamba said. So on those days, what do you do? What do you do on the difficult days that just nothing tragic happened? They just were difficult. You woke up and you had gum in your hair or you woke up and, you know, you, you you have a giant zit on your forehead and all these kind of things are just normal problems. But as Heidi already kind of mentioned, they can throw off your whole day and, and bigger than just your experience of the day. And this is where I want to start our conversation, because let's start with Alexander. This whole day starts uh, for the whole family because Alexander puts a curse on the family. <laughs> Alexander, on the very first day, has a horrible day. Terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And he thinks no one else cares that he has a bad day. And he thinks they never struggle. He's the only one who struggles. So he puts a curse out. My kids are like, our curse is real. You know, they're trying to figure that out. And I said, well, not like that. I said, but here is, the Bible talks a lot about curses. And what that means is to wish evil on other people. That you, in your imagination, in your heart, and maybe even in your words and actions, you want other people to feel bad. And maybe that's because you feel bad. And I, 
I'm telling you, your your five year old can understand that because they do the same thing. I feel bad, and I want other people to feel bad. That's the beginning of this. So, how do we use this movie to help have that conversation with our kids about some days you just feel like that, but that is not the way Jesus wants us to be. How does this movie help us do that? Who who wants to start on this? I I think that like, you know, a big part of that is looking at all the different characters' reactions. That's what I think like the biggest strength of this movie is is the diversity of character and like what is it that kind of how do they experience these anxiety inducing problems that they come into contact with um and i you know you you said it at the beginning Jennifer Garner's character is maybe the most interesting cuz she's like the emotional pillar and she's also going through a lot in this movie is the thing um she's from a character perspective, she's the most interesting character in this movie, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's also kind of like, she's the character where we can be like, okay, does she handle everything perfectly? Absolutely not. But she definitely, I don't know, maybe I'm just like trying to be like, there's like something good that we can look at in a character in this movie. But like, I think that like that character in particular definitely has that, um, perseverance of like i'm not gonna let this failure define anything okay yeah well and i think i think for a lot of our kids and maybe donnie and and heidi can speak to this about especially when your kids are young there is a way in which they become so emotionally wrapped up in their problems and i'm saying this like it's only children right? We have the same problem, but you become so emotionally wrapped up in your problems. You can't see past the problems and Mm -hmm. you can't see the other people. Uh, How do you have those kind of conversations with your kids about, Hey, this does matter. I don't want to invalidate what you're feeling, but you can't let this destroy your day. Does someone want to speak to that? Yeah. I think, I think what you said there was really important. You know, you don't ever want to like jump past, you know, what they're feeling because like I, I see so often that adults will handle things, you know, yeah, it's a different magnitude, but, um, that they'll handle things in a lot of similarities with their kids where, you know, well, I can't deal with this right now because I have so much going on, you know, but you don't see these parents in this movie. They've got, I mean, just crazy chaos going on all around them. And like you had mentioned earlier, things weren't great before that. You know, they're each dealing with their own struggles, him unemployed, her working full time and and being the breadwinner um, when she had been at home with the other kids, things like that. And so I think, you know, kind of like I mentioned where Steve Carell is and Jennifer Garner too, as you were talking, Sawyer, it made me think more about her character. They both kind of, have this, uh, resilience, you know, that, that word we mentioned, um, that resilience where they just keep pushing through and they just keep on looking at the next circumstance that they come up as an opportunity for things to change. And when it doesn't, they're okay with it, you know, and they just keep on rolling with it. I think that's really important. Um, like I, I mentioned before to, live that out so that our kids see it and see what it looks like to keep doing that in situations. And then we can, you know, have more opportunities, I think, to explain to them, well, you know, this, this doesn't have to be the end of it. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to get stuck here. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was, I was talking like one of the things I've been doing more so with my kids, especially in the situations where they're the most emotional <clears throat> about a situation, whatever it usually is, I usually try to either just kind of sit with them um, or I usually will try to not distract them, but put their their feeling, take it out of their emotional s- space and more to just sit with the problem and try yeah. to understand it. Because like, for instance, like, I like, you know, they may be having like getting loud about something like they wanted some snack or they wanted five more minutes, you know, before bedtime or something like that. And, and I'll kind of sit there and I'll go, you know, if they have something, whatever, I'll be like, so, um, what's, what's that you're uh, doing? 
And so it kind of takes their mind off of that emotion at that moment. So then I can have a logical conver, have an actual conversation with them. Like, so what made you so upset and things like that? Because I think much like, you know, with kids, us as adults have, have difficulty with slowing down when we're dealing with something, because what happens is it's that idea that we have to solve it super quickly because we have something else. It's like the idea is like, you know, as being the fire department, you have other fires to put out. So maybe you try to do everything super quickly, but in the moment you don't actually put the fire out. You just kind of settled it for a moment while it actually continues to burn under the, you know, under the surface. And I think this movie like shows you a lot of that stuff, especially when you're dealing with these things, because I like the fact that like Steve Carell um, character was very much there with them he was present with them when he was interacting with them even when they got a little upset yeah and i think that's so key because i mean as a parent i've there been times where you know it's like hey just get over it. it's not a big deal it's just the i don't care it's just the lego okay it's just your favorite green lego i don't care i'm throwing it away it's broken you know but to them in that moment it means so much yeah and it's sometimes that's the that's the only thing as a parent that we need to do is slow down and just listen well and i think i think what we want to talk about so i agree with what you're saying there especially about the slowing down part and i know there are parents who are listening are like i can't slow down for every problem and that's right you can't you can't you only got 24 hours in the day and Mm -hmm. sometimes i mean having a little kid especially when you've got multiple uh that are right around the same age i heard a thing a couple of years ago that said from the ages of five to 10, if you have siblings from the ages of five to 10, they will argue once every 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is that accurate? Rob, th- th- yeah, that's, I was going to say, Donnie and I are both in that place. <laughs> uh, uh, and Heidi, I know you've got a three year old, but soon we'll be, uh, we'll be in that place. And they're just bickering about everything. You can't, every argument can't become, you know, a conversation, mm-hmm. but certainly when I think what Donnie's talking about, I think it's true is, these big emotional breakdown moments where kids just, and you can see it and every kid has a different thing. Like, you know, you can see it. I have one girl who, who cries just about, but that's because her frustration has gotten to a point. She's going to cry. I have another one who explodes and just going to yell and start screaming. I've got another that just gets up and removes herself and just does it, which seems like a good thing, but she often will just isolate and never speak to anybody. Mm -hmm. And, to be able to see those and go, okay, let me step into that and help you deal with that emotion instead of like what I know uh, Donnie's already said that we often do a get over it. Nope. Too bad. You got to go. You got to keep moving. Uh, And so one thing I think that is helpful, and I try to have this with my kids a lot is this kind of idea of that attitude is more important than feelings. And it's not that feelings don't matter. You can't change though your feelings all the time, but you can always change your attitude. I remember when I was a kid, I would wake up and I would just be in a bad mood. And sometimes all of us, even as an adult, I wake up and I'm just in a bad mood. And my mom would often say, okay, I'm sorry you're in a bad mood, but you need to fix your attitude. And attitude is about your perspective. Attitude is about how am I going to view other people and situations and my responsibility throughout the day, no matter how I feel. I still have to acknowledge how I feel and deal with how I feel and being able to say to one of my kids, I get that you're mad and you don't want to speak to your sister right now, but we have to go to church and mm-hmm. we're not going to not go to church because you're in a bad mood. And you don't want to speak to anybody. So you now need to figure out how am I going to have an attitude, whether I have, whether no matter how I feel, how do I fix my attitude so that I can do what I am responsible to do? Does that make, you know what I'm saying? Does, is yeah. that, um, does that kind of go towards what we're talking about? Oh yeah. yeah I absolutely. think so. Sorry, Donnie. No, I think no. so often that comes from like asking questions. I think, you know, yeah. what you were saying about, um, you know, we can't stop for every problem, but what you described in your different kids is like when they get stuck and, you know, yes. that kind of goes back to that whole idea. Um, like if, if, we see them moving through their day and continuing to progress and move past stuff. It's one thing, but when they get stuck, 
those questions, like you were talking about, Donnie, the, you know, just asking some questions, whether it be, let me distract you from this for a moment. Let's talk about something else. And then let's circle back. And, mm-hmm. and I, I find that that works best with my kids. And, you know, you see Steve Carell kind of model that in this, he's just, like you said, like a calming presence. He's not invalidating of what's going on, but he is helping them to try to push forward through it and not get stuck. Mm -hmm. Because it's about like, it's so much about like teaching them the tools to handle the problems than it is to tell them to get, just move past the problems. Because I think too much of is it a lot of times can be, okay, this is what's wrong. Here's your solution versus, okay, so when you get upset, what can you do to maybe calm yourself down? What do you, what makes you feel better? What brings you back to focusing on what's going on? And I think it's so it's cause that's the thing I try my best to do is like, I, I can't fix every problem that they have or every frustration they encounter. Cause I don't have that much time. Um, but I can go, Hey, what would you do differently? You know what, you know, okay, well, would you want this person, a person to treat your sister the way you just treated your sister? Or would you want someone to treat your brother the way, you know, you treated your brother and things that help them to make it more personal because like it, sometimes it gets where we're like trying to give them this perfect answer and like, Hey, just do this and everything will be fine. And then when it doesn't work, they, they panic, you know, and it's, it's so, difficult as a parent to see your kids struggling or to suffer but like Heidi was talking about it's like that moment where when you see they're stuck and being able to identify that they're stuck and then knowing okay this is now where I can step in with what I know and in parks so whether it's wisdom or maybe it's just sitting there and being present yeah well Donnie I think the thing you said that is huge and this is the importance I think of, of doing this and maybe even having the conversations. Let's talk about how I have a conversation out of this movie. Everything that we've said, I think, is very helpful for us as a parent to help our kids. But we also, and Donnie said this earlier, we want to give them the tools to be able to regulate their own emotions. That I don't always have to be the one to step in and regulate their emotions. When they're really young, that's important that I have someone. But as they get older, they've got to learn this because they're going to spend more and more time away from me. And I don't want... Uh, And I'll just say, I see a lot of young people, and I'm talking about young adults, 18, 19, 20, who mom has always fixed all my problems for me and never taught me to regulate disappointment. And how do I deal with frustration? And so I just shut down. So how do I create, how do I help my kids? And one thing I think that Heidi talked about, and it was actually the role of uh, Steve Carell's character, the dad who did this, but you talked about the idea of trying to change the tone, that I can't fix my day And this goes to the point I think I was saying as well about attitude. I can change my attitude. I can change my perspective on the day. Heidi, you want to talk about how this movie could help us say to our kids, hey, try and try and be like this when you have a rough day. Yeah. Like what, um, what do we have control over? You know, like we don't have control over everything. He just kept on pushing through. And that was the thing. Like he kept pushing through and he kept on looking for you know, looking at each situation that was coming up as an opportunity for things to change. Um, and I think that's really important that, you know, cause Jesus talks about it. And that's the, one of the last things he says is that we will have trouble, you know, <laughs> things are yeah. going to be hard here. And I think it's really good that we talk to our kids about that and prepare them for that. Um, help them to not, you know, try to just, brush past those things and not feel them, but also, you know, to continue to look for ways to control what we can control and keep, keep a positive outlook as we move forward. I think that's huge. And I think being able to help model it for them in daily life is huge. Um, Now here's one thing I want to talk about. Heidi already kind of talked about the unrealistic nature of it, but I think it's such a beautiful picture for us of not only our family, but the church in general as the spiritual family of God, um, this idea of really the way the movie gets solved is, hey, we're not going to fix these problems and a lot of the problems don't get fixed, but we as a family are going to come together and really choose to say, hey, we're going to just be with each other. And somehow by being together, even though things don't get magically fixed, uh, our attitude, our experience of the day 
gets better. Sawyer, do you want to talk about how even you as the villain of the podcast, did you did you did 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 your cold dead robot heart did it did it come to life a little bit when this family just starts working together? Um does not compute. So here's the thing. I I don't find this movie super heartwarming, but I I, I, I think too. that families will enjoy it is the thing. And I think that families will find it heartwarming. Look, I am not the target audience at all of this movie is the thing. Um, and so there's that going against it as well. But look, to your point, it is a very sweet movie across the board. And the ending is equally sweet as yeah. the rest of the movie is the thing. Sweet is the best um, adjective I can give this movie. Oh, it's 100%. A very sweet it's movie very sweet movie. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, uh, like the way, that, like I like the final set of like, they're like, look, we're going to have this party, whether it's the last thing we do or not. Is the right. Thing. I kind of, I kind of actually, I really like that mentality of we are going to get this party done. Whether we whether it kills us or not, and I oh, especially I like when that. Thunder from Down Under shows up, exactly. that's just the best. <laughs> that, is, that I do like. I do like that. I, I well, and I love, and I'll just tell you this: as a parent, that scene where it's Thunder from Down Under. So for people who are going to watch the movie and you haven't seen it, they the whole thing is that Alexander wants an Australian themed birthday party, so he he gets what he thinks are like Australian cowboys, but it turns out it's Thunder from Down Under, which is like a uh, male dance troupe an adult male dance troupe and the the guys are about to which by the way is already bizarre enough the whole crowd is full of kids i don't know why the guys are going through their normal routine but uh the, but the parents have to step in and stop them and the guys do a whole kind of routine that's age, age appropriate for kids but the moment where the parents are just laughing about oh this is our life that felt the most real of anything the amount of times my wife and i have to look at each other and just laugh at how bad a day was or how rough things were going in our family and how that laughter is very healing. I mean, did you guys, Heidi, Donnie, I mean, do you, do you guys experience that as well? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I th yeah. I think, yeah, good. I think sometimes like that is um, it's it. So, and I talked to a little bit about this earlier, um, I think, but like, misery loves company that whole like idea behind that like we shouldn't but we all do feel that connection that companionship and it kind of goes to what you were saying about the body of christ and how like we as a family of god um can come together and so like when when you and your wife or or me and my husband you know when we go through days like that and we can like look at each other and just be like what just happened you know yeah. um i think that it is so bonding um and it's so connecting and it's a reminder that like even if it's not you know if you're not married or if you don't have kids or whatever that you always do have this relationship with god and with his community with his body that you're not in this alone and yeah. while it seems almost like impossibly challenging some of the things that come up and just make chaos in our day, like we are, we're not doing it alone. And yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I think to, I think to that point too, Heidi, I think there's such a powerful thing to be able to teach our kids. Like I, I my, 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 um, parents and I were together just recently for a, a, we actually had some people over for an event. Sawyer was there and we were talking about this, these family game nights we used to have and how by the end of them, nobody wanted to speak to each other. And we were all just laughing about it. But I remember being in those moments and that was a bad day. Like we were all so mad. We were all so fresh. We didn't, but there's a thing to be able to see our kids of, and now we all laugh about it. You remember when so-and-so had a temper tantrum about yeah. that or so-and-so yelled at one another but we're still together and we yeah. still, and we can, and it, and it gives you power in those moments where people say things like, you know, one day we're going to laugh about this. Yeah. And be able, go ahead. Donnie. Cause it, yeah. Cause there's the idea of that vulnerability that brings us together. Like when you're vulnerable yes. and you've had that rough day and you have someone that you can connect with and go, so you saw that too. Okay. So we're, yeah. Oh, woo. I'm not nuts. <laughs> she actually said those words out loud. Yeah. Exactly. And it's something about that because in that vulnerability, it gives us an opportunity to be resilient yeah. because it's, it's those tough moments. I mean, as 
you know, it's kind of the idea of the iron sharpens iron. And like, it's the company that you keep that helps you to build the community that you have. Like, you know, if I have people that are just an echo chamber to the things I think, you know, that's not going to help me. Um, I need people with different perspectives. And a lot of times those perspectives may just be someone that can understand the pain I'm going through. And that yeah. might be your, your spouse and you're all look. All right. So you, you were ready to fight too. Okay. Yeah. I was ready to fight too. Okay. We're good then. You know, and like, yeah. And Cause like the frustrations get to you. And I think those moments when we laugh about it and we look back on it, because as much as the stress may be like may hit hard during those moments, it's something about being able to reflect on it and go, you know what? We went through all these things and we're still standing. We're yeah. still, we're still here. It's not a, you know, it, this wasn't the breaking point. It was a, it was a chip in the armor, but the armor was repaired by everything else and the people around me. Well, and I think being able to say our kids, this is why we need one another as a family, but this yeah. is why you also need brothers and sisters in Christ. This is why the church is more than just, as we say, it's more than just content you consume. It's not just learning. When my kids will say something, I love, I'll say, you know, what, what do we do at church? We learn about Jesus. I said, no, we love Jesus by loving one another and yeah. trying to get that in their head. Church is not a curriculum that you go and you learn things. And once I've learned every Bible story, I've learned it all. It's a place where we practice loving Jesus by loving one another and being able to teach them. You need these people. And in some ways you need them more than you need me. In yeah. some ways, even though I'm your dad, and I said that the other day of my kids are just now starting to get to that age where they are willing to listen to other adults more than they will. Let. Things I've said, they're not hearing, but they hear it from other adults. And I used to be on the other side of that as a youth minister and knowing that, you know, parents would come to me and go, so guess what Mr. Nathan told my kid that, you know, I've been saying for five years and they won't listen to, but you say it one time. But I, as a, and I know those parents are very thankful. I know I'm saying it like that. They, they were very thankful for me. And I am so thankful now on the same side for adults who build into my kids. And I want to be able to say to my kids, listen to them, yeah. care about, care what they say, build friendships here. Um, but yeah. I, I have a couple notes. Does anyone have anything they want to add on that before we wrap? I have two things I want to say to parents. I would uh, say based on like what you were just talking about, I think the thing I try to remind my kids is there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. Um, because the idea of knowing everything or knowing all the things, but never applying it is the equivalent of knowing that your car can drive and never starting it and driving. That's like, good. it's like you just like, cause so much of it is, Oh, well, I know, I know, I know. Like when you tell them something, they're like, I know it's like, well, why didn't you do it? You yep. didn't apply what you knew. So you just let that knowledge go to waste. And then they look at you go, Oh, I don't want to agree with you, but you're kind of right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I want to wrap up with these two thoughts for parents I think are huge is everything we've said has been true of for your kids, but it's also very true for you, uh, for you to have a community. And, and Donnie already mentioned, it's really important that you and your spouse have that, but maybe, maybe you're a single parent or maybe you're co-parenting and, and that's not a possibility. But I'll say this, even if you're, you know, you're married and you and your spouse have a great relationship, the importance of having other parents to laugh about, to tell stories with and go, wow, can you believe what my kid did the other day? And you to be able to laugh and to know, oh, we as Christian parents, as brothers and sisters of Christ, we're all going through the same stuff. That is so huge. We have these parenting events, like uh, at the time we're filming this, we've got this pool party coming up. Uh, and the goal of those is not just that you and your family would have a good time, but that we surround you with older parents who have already done this and they've gone through this and that they can be a community for you, that they can go, I remember what it was like to be raising a 13 year old. I remember, oh yeah, that, you know what? Hey, you're doing a great job. That's important. It's important for you to have a small group. It's important for you to have other adults who can speak into your life. That is huge because you really do, as Heidi's already said, you set the tone. You set the tone for your house. And here's unfortunately what I see happen in a lot of families. And I'm speaking out of my own family. We get so tied up in what our kids are feeling and sometimes the anxiety and chaos in our home that we become very reactive and we get caught up in their sadness and we get caught up in theirs and we begin reacting out of their emotion and we are not helping them. We are spiraling it up. We are making it bigger because I'm bigger and louder and I can make your, if you want to be angry, you want to be angry. Guess who can be angrier? You want to be sad? Guess who can, Ooh, I, we can do this and it doesn't help. And what it reminds me of is there is a, uh, 
Jewish rabbi who was also a fair, uh, family therapist named Edwin Friedman, and he had actually written this book about leadership. But in it, he talks about this idea of what every, he said, our anxious world, our anxious families, and anxious for him doesn't just mean worried or even like a mental health thing. He Anxious is you are reactive to your circumstances. If things are good, you're good. If things are bad, you're freaked out and you're moving in. You're in the chaos of whatever is bad. And he says what our anxious families and workplaces and what they, uh, fa- uh, you know, world needs are non-anxious leaders. And that means non-anxious parents. And this is how he describes it. He says, I mean someone who has clarity about who they are and has He's not a Christian, but as a believer, who I am in Christ, therefore, someone who is less likely to become lost in the anxious emotional processes swirling about them. I mean someone who can be separate while still remaining connected and therefore can maintain a modifying, non-anxious, and sometimes challenging presence. So I want to just clarify what that means. A person who I am, I realize me and my children are separate. And I am compassionate. I'm still connected to them. I care that they hurt. I care that they're angry. I care this. But I realize just because they're upset doesn't mean I'm upset. And therefore, I can be this modifying, non-anxious, and even challenging presence go, hey, let me challenge your, your emotion for a moment here. Let me bring a different perspective to your emotion. Let me bring another side to this. And then he goes on. I mean someone who can manage his or her own reactivity to the automatic reactivity of others and therefore be able to take stands at the risk of displeasing as a parent that we could be so, uh, I could manage my reactivity to the fact that you're upset with the decision I just made. I can be reactive to the fact that I didn't fix your problem and my child is going to kind of struggle through something and I want to fix it to fix their emotion. And really the reason I want to fix their emotion is because I'm tired of feeling bad that they feeling that they're feeling bad. A person who can say, you may be upset with me as mom because you don't like my decision, but I've made a decision that I think is best for you. Those parents are powerful. Those parents actually change the tone of their families. And so I just want to encourage you the way that you become that is one with your relationship with Christ, but also your relationship with other believers who can say, Hey, I know she just screamed. I hate you and slammed the door, but your mom and you love her and you're doing the right thing. And I remember what it was like when my kid slammed the door and said, it it hurts so bad, but you cannot get drawn into her, her, her chaos right now. Cause guess what? She's 13 and being 13 is chaotic enough. She don't need a chaotic mom. She needs a mom or a dad who can, who can be, a non-anxious presence. And so this is a fun movie. This is not a movie that has to be that, but I just, I just want to, that is, that has become my, my heartbeat as a parent is just trying to become this non-anxious presence. And it's tough because I am an emotional reaction back. Uh, Heidi, were you going to say something? I want to give you the last word if you had something to say. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, you know, it's, it's interesting because as you describe that, <clears throat> that quote, as you say it, I'm thinking, yeah, Jesus, like that's yeah. exactly what he does. And so I just want to kind of highlight what you said about the way we do this is through our relationship with him and our relationship with others, because, you know, we, um, it's it, a lot of times, you know, Jesus will show up to us in our relationships with others and he'll be able to speak yeah. to us and give us a different perspective. And so I think that's the thing It's you know, when we get in those moments, when we can connect with others and connect with him and just say, Uh, what my kid tapped on right there was my own insecurity, my own fear, my, you know, my, um, who I am, they're brushing up against my personality, but you see that happen constantly throughout the Bible in Jesus's life. And he doesn't, he's not reactionary. You yep. see him handle things. You see him challenge so much. So many he's people, asleep so in many the back situations. Of a, a boat. Yeah. 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 And he's, you know, he's going into the temple. You think, Oh, he's angry. You know, he's lashing out, but in reality, it was very timed. It was very premeditated and all of that, you know? And so I think just like, like to kind of look look to that and say, I can be challenging, but I also don't have to react to yep. the the things that are going on around me. Because if there's a reaction in us, it's usually based on an insecurity, you know, or a fear that we have. And so recognizing that, not reacting and dealing with whatever that feeling, you know, whatever that provoked. Um, yeah. 
let that feeling be a, a, a catalyst, but not a companion in that moment and, and address it in the way that we would, you know, would if we were not emotionally provoked by it. I think that's great. And I want to give you kudos for not reacting as your, your child was walking in the background there. Oh, yeah. And the husband coming up to try to get the kid out. I'm like, which one's more distracting? I love that. I thought that was great. That was a perfect example of it. So we're going to end it there. We think this movie's a lot of fun. It certainly gives you a lot of great things to talk about with your kids to help them love Jesus and his way of life even more. We'll see you next week.